topic that I've got this here is is faith rational and not that it's, it's faith irrational, so I'm going to be really talking on a totally different topic. <laughs> I'd like to thank the two organisations for giving me the opportunity to talk on this important question. The, the motto of my old school was Fidelis Askew ad Mortem, faithful even under death, which I used to think was pretty cool until I discovered it was also the model, motto of the notorious World War II German battle cruiser, the Admiral Graf Spey, at the Battle of the River Plant Fame. It was a bit of a gloss on the uh, motto. Okay, the question we're going to explore is, is faith rational? Faith is a, a significant notion in many religions, but because we're here today discussing the issue with a Christian group, it seems sensible to focus on the Christian understanding of faith. Although the word faith is hardly used at all in the Old Testament, it occurs over 300 times in the New Testament. There are three possible answers to the question, is faith rational, or is faith is irrational for that matter? Um, but I've got is faith rational, so I'll stick to it. The first answer, of course, is yes, it is rational, which means we can all go home. <laughs> Second answer, no, it isn't rational, but this doesn't matter because rationality is irrelevant and faith is a superior part to spiritual knowledge. And the third possible answer is, no, it isn't rational and this disqualifies it from being a central support for somebody's beliefs. I'll be arguing for the last answer. First of all, I want to say a bit about what it is to be rational. The word, of course, comes from the Latin ratio, which means reason, and something is rational if it's the product of good reasons. Beliefs, actions and feelings can all be rational if you can support them with, log with arguments that are logically sound, based on evidence that's empirically reliable, and if these arguments and evidence outweigh any arguments or evidence to the contrary conclusion. Furthermore, we should try to ensure that our, that our reasoning has not been contaminated by one of the possible sources of bias for example, prejudice, self-interest, emotion, or the dictates of authority. In fact, we're gathered here today to use logic and demand arguments and to present evidence and to explore concepts, and to advance reasons for and against the proposition in question, in short, to use our rationality. This is what universities are on about. So if there's anybody present who doesn't accept the tenets of rational discourse, may I respectfully suggest you're in the wrong place. Perhaps you could quietly leave. <laughs> <laughs> Although there's no ultimate and comprehensive set of rules or procedures for determining definitively if a given belief, action or feeling is rational, there are many sets of principles, such as the rules of logic, principles of reasoning, like Occam's razor, and the methodology of scientific investigation, which applied appropriately tend to ensure that our beliefs, our actions and our feelings are rational enough. We exercise judgment about how far any instance, how far in any instance it's appropriate to apply such standards. If someone just demanded that we demonstrate that our barricade for Collingwood was a totally rational act, we would dismiss this demand as frivolous. On the other hand, and I think it is totally totally irrational actually. But on the other hand, <laughs> with issues of cosmic significance, such as whether there's a person called God, who created and continues to maintain the universe and requires our worship, we would expect someone to have very sound reasons for holding or not holding such a belief and have gone to considerable trouble to ensure that the reasons were in fact sound. Now it seems to me that in Christianity there are two main clusters of meaning around which, uh, about, about, of faith, that's the concept of faith, which I call, for want of better terms, attitudinal faith and ontological faith. Historically, attitudinal faith became first. The meaning of faith in the early church was attitudinal faith. It had to do with trust in God and hope for his or her future blessing. Thus, the New Christian Bible dictionary defines faith as, quote, an attitude whereby a person abandons all reliance on his own efforts to obtain salvation and relies on Christ alone for all that salvation means, unquote. And attitudinal faith does not raise directly questions of rationality or irrationality, except that 
If a trusted being or entity continually and unjustifiably broke our trust over a long period of time, it might be considered irrational to continue trusting them. I'll return to this point at the end of my exploration. Now, if we date, for sake of argument, human intellectual history from some time in the middle of the millennium before Jesus, we have to note that for most of the last two and a half thousand years, attitudinal faith was the only meaning of faith that was intelligible. During this time, what we might call the orthodox or canonical worldview was totally dominant. And the idea that there might not be a God was virtually unthinkable. Everybody accepted that in the beginning, the only thing that existed was a supernatural being or beings, called God or gods. It was accepted that this supernatural being or beings created the world, the natural world, including human beings, and that this supernatural being or beings watch over the world and sometimes intervene in it, rewarding or punishing human beings as appropriate. The main spiritual task of human beings at this time was to establish their relationship with this being or beings and to find out what was required to earn their blessing, that is, what sacrifices should be made, what rituals carried out, and what behaviours adhered to. God was a given. The question was which God of the many available did you, could you trust in? The role of faith was to engender hope and trust in a specific God, not to make an ontological leap. That came later. For now, no one doubted the existence of the supernatural world inhabited by powerful beings. Have faith in Jesus, in Jesus and he will save you. The implication of this, or one of the implications of this, is that all the references to faith in the New Testament but of faith in this first sense, and attitudinal faith. And none of them there on the second sense of faith that hadn't arisen yet, ontological faith. I want to argue that once the question of God's existence has been raised, which it was uh, a couple of thousand years later, and be, uh, had become problematic, then ontological faith, faith in the existence of a supernatural being at all, become, became paramount. You can't have faith in someone or something, unless they exist. The ontological question is prior to the attitudinal question. But on the ontological question, the Bible, and in particular, the New Testament, the silent. During the second half of the second millennium after Jesus, the orthodox or canonical view of the world as God's creation began to be seriously questioned for the first time. The whole way of looking at the world began to be undermined simultaneously both by advances in science and by the arguments of thinkers such as Spinoza, Voltaire, David Hume and Immanuel Kant. As more and more of the mysteries of the natural world were unravelled by science, the deity was reduced to the well-known god of the gaps. The final nail in the coffin of the orthodox or canonical view was probably the publication just 150 years ago in 1859 of Charles Darwin's The Origin of Species. In the second half of the, 20th century, of the 19th century, there was a tectonic shift in the intellectual geology. The secular point of view, based on reason and evidence, became the received view, the standard position. And religion, no longer a given, had to justify itself in the light of the evidence. Faith had changed its role. 